chapter 31, verse 10 says, if correctly reading, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that she shall have no need, uh, that he shall have no need of support. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maiden. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planted a vineyard. She girdled her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold to the staff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hand to the, to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and setteth it and delivereth girdles to the merchant. Strength and honor her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. Then, if you will, in 1 Timothy, and this is, gets right down to the meat of the matter. 1 Timothy, uh, uh, here Paul is t uh, uh, telling the women what the women in the church should be. Verse 9 says, In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. With shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair, gold, or pearl, or, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn, uh, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed in Eve, Adam was deceived. Uh, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and wholeness with sobriety. Father, thank you for just allowing us to come to the house of God today. Father, as we try to uh, uh, preach this message this morning. We try to teach uh, our women uh, what godly women should be, what their place in the church should be, what their place in the family should be. Lord, where they should be, uh, God, uh, in your sight. Father, this is not my words, but it's yours. And I ask, Father, that you'd help these ladies to understand their place and not just to understand it, but to get in it. And we'll thank you and praise you for it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. This is some pretty strong stuff, isn't it, women? In this day in church age that we're living in today, women don't want to hear this. Women say, oh, I've got, uh, I've got as much voice in the church as the men do. That's true, you have a vote, but you don't have a voice. There's a difference in a vote and a voice. These men ought to be men enough to run this church. And you women ought to be in subjection to God and to your husbands enough to let them. If you have opinions, go to your husband with your opinion. Let your husband then uh, if he agrees with your opinion, express it to the church. But see, that's the problem, I believe, with the church as it exists today. Everything has got out of whack. Right. People are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
They're not in their place where they ought to be. Everybody's got their own position that they think they should take in the church. Why don't we use God's position? And let what the Word of God say be truth and let everything else be a lie. I know it's not popular, and I know some of you women don't want to hear this today. But it's time, ladies, we say we want to win our children to God. We say we want this church here to prosper. We want it to grow. We want it to uh, be what uh, a, a church that God would bless and respect. If we're going to do that, we've got to all get in our place from the pulpit to the smallest member on the pew. If we expect to have revival, now we all said we want revival. I told you this a thousand times. I still believe that we've got one of the best evangelists coming that ever walked behind the pulpit. Brother Mike Ragland is a man of God if there's ever been a man of God. I believe that. But Brother Mike Ragland cannot bring revival to Pine View Baptist Church. Amen. If it comes, it has got to come through the members of this church. Amen. And it's got to come through obedience to God. Amen. If you're not obedient to God, how can you expect Him to give you revival? He gave us recipe for revival. He said uh, 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 in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, If my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves. See, that's the hardest word uh, in the vocabulary where all of us are concerned. Me, you, but let's just be honest and lay it out there like it is. Uh, I'm as guilty as you are, but that's the hardest word in the vocabulary for us to do, is to be humble. That's right. But in order for us to have revival, the first thing he said, if my people shall humble themselves, and pray. Not say a prayer, but pray a prayer. We talked about that this morning in here. It's hard to pray a prayer when, uh, uh, when you feel defeated in your life. When your marriage is in shambles. When you, uh, you, your finances are in shambles. When uh, everything that, uh, that uh, you're dealing with in your life is in shambles. Hey, it's hard to pray. Because you don't know what to pray for. We talked about David this morning, how that David had got down and out and how that uh, his life was all in a mess. And uh, he got to the point to where he didn't even know how to pray. And he finally said, Lord, you're my strength. You're my talent. I'm at a point, Lord, where I don't even know how to pray. Amen. But I need you to help me. Right. <laughs> and it would do us all good at Pine View Baptist Church this morning to find this altar, get in it, and say, God, help me to find my place. Help me to humble myself to you. And help me to be what I know I'm supposed to be so that my children can be saved, that my grandchildren can be saved. You see, they watch in your life. Your life's the only Bible some of them ever read. That's right. Amen. And if your life doesn't meet up to a godly woman or a godly man, then your testimony is no good. It's no and void. If you're not doing what a woman is supposed to do or what a man is supposed to do according to the principles of God's Word, your testimony, you can testify all day long, but it don't meet God's requirements. That's plain, isn't it? But it's the truth. That if they'll humble themselves and pray and what? Seek my face. What did he say? Seek my will. Mm -hmm. Phil, 
just seek my will. That's what we need today, is to seek the will of God. Not the will of Stanley or the will of Bud or the will of uh, uh, Ken or the will of Bob or the, uh, the will of uh, Susan or Cheryl or Shirley. But the will of God! Amen. He said, then, once you humbled yourself, once you prayed, once you seek my face or seek my will in your life, then I will hear from heaven. Amen. I'll answer your prayers. Amen. Then if you're going to read on a little further, he said, I'll open the windows of heaven. And I'll pour you out a blessing that you can't even contain. Amen. Amen. That's my God talking. Amen. That's your God. We ain't talking about a little old wimp saying something. We're talking about the mighty God. The God of this universe. The God that holds it all together. That's God talking. And if we'll get where we're supposed to be, brother, God will bless our life. Amen. Amen. Now I want you to notice what he said. Ladies, your responsibility. To his church. What? It ain't our church. Pine View ain't my church. That's right. I hear people say, oh, that's Stanley Layton's church. Pine View's not Stanley Layton's church. It's God's church. Amen. 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 Yeah. That's right. And if it ain't God's church, we in trouble. Amen. All right. Your responsibility to the, to the church, the first, uh, did you notice the first thing that he brought attention to was your dress. Y'all ain't, some of you ain't gonna like this. But that's a first, you know, we, we live in a time now where everybody wants to just, I gotta get rid of these shoes, they killing me and they hurt my mind. Everybody wants to dress any way they want to dress. Right. This is God's house. Amen. We ought to dress like we're going to God's house. That's right. Amen. Hey, churches that won't even let me preach in them because they know how I feel about this. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> there's people that don't like me for the simple fact that I believe this is God's house ought to be reverenced as God's house. Amen. When we come in God's house, we ought to be wearing the very best we got. Amen. I looked at, uh, at these men as they come in today. You look good, man. That tells me you ladies take pride in what you wear at church. That in the mind had an awful time this morning <laughs> trying to get me dressed. <laughs> Every pair of pants I got got the hem door out of. <laughs> I'd get a pair and I'd go in there. I'd get a suit and I'd go in there and have the shirts laid out and all that stuff and I'd go in there and put it on the hem out of it. She said, Phil, have told me the hem. <laughs> Was that out of it? I said, I didn't know. She was jacking me up. And rightfully so. She can't fix something if she don't know it's broke. It wasn't her responsibility to tell, uh, to find out the hem was out of my suit. It was my responsibility to say, Susan, the hem's out of my suit. Will you fix it? But instead of that, I get mad at her. Hey, you ought to fix that, you know. It ain't her problem. It's my problem. It's my suit. It's my problem. But we want to transfer that problem to somebody else. Yeah. So I made my confession this morning. <laughs> I have the best pastor's wife in this world. Amen. Amen. <laughs> There's a lot of churches don't like her. Because she is a pastor's wife. 
She don't lay out of church and go to ball games. My kids, some of them don't like, don't like it because we don't go to functions that the kids are in. I pastor a church. My wife is a pastor's wife, and she is going to be here to support me. She is not going to lay out of church Amen. to sponsor, uh, to go see a ball game that ought to have been played on a day other than Sunday. Amen. Amen. So they can get mad, glad, or whatever. There's a lot of churches don't like her because she's sympathetic. Because she believes in helping the needy. Did I just read that? Or was that God's word I read? Or she believes in helping folks. And a lot of a lot of folks don't like her for that reason. I could go into it detail and explain it, but I won't. I don't have to. I shouldn't have to. She don't have to. As long as she's doing what God's leading her to do. She don't have to explain nothing to nobody. But it said, first of all, she needs to dress in modest apparel. Have you ever looked that word up? Ever looked up? what that means. I looked it up. Hey, I've been studying for this message. That means in reverent apparel. Look it up. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, you go home, get your, hey, get out your little concordance, get your dictionary out, your little blinds dictionary, whatever you use, and you'll find out that it means to dress in reverent apparel. <coughs> in other words, when a woman comes to the house of God, she ought to look like she's going to church. Amen. They come in and look like they're going to the ball field and everywhere else. Right. Their short breeches on, their tank tops and I'm telling you what's the truth. I ain't never seen such a mess in my life and you tell me God's pleased with that. No ma'am, he ain't. Mm -hmm. Now, pantsuits. There's a woman's pantsuit and not men's blue jeans. And they don't have to be so tight you can see every line you got. That's right. Help me, Lord, preach this, because they some don't like it. <laughs> what I'm telling you is, and then he went on with the braided hair. He wasn't talking about it was wrong to wear braided hair or pearls. What he was talking about was I'd rather see you instead of wearing braided hair. <laughs> Instead of trying to look uh, look like somebody that's going to a brothel, to look like you're going to church. <laughs> it ain't popular, is it? But it's true. I like makeup on a woman. As long as she don't gob it on until it looks like she's got a plastic <laughs> face. Right. Ain't nothing wrong with wearing them. Like Ain't nothing no prettier to me than to see a woman get the squall and then the house of God and that makeup go running down. Right? <laughs> That's a pretty woman to me. But people go overboard with this stuff. He said, not with the braid and the hair, but with the inward adorning. He said it, hey, ladies, it's more important to be adorned inside than it is outside. It's more important that your life meet your testimony than it is to be have all of this braided hair and all of these other things that you have. So the first place that we need to start is inside, right? Mm -hmm. 
Let's get the inside straightened out. That's what he's telling them. Get the inside straightened out. And if the inside straightened out, the outside will follow. You show me that's a child, uh, a, a woman that's a child of God, I'll show you a woman that her life, her lifestyle, her dress, everything about her will follow suit when she gets right with God. Amen. I got to hurry. I won't ever get through the first point. So he said, dress with modest or respectable apparel. He said, with shamefacedness or with modesty. Be modest. And with good works. What did I read to you in Proverbs? Her works will praise her in the streets. And you know what else? Your works don't just reflect on you but they reflect on your husband they reflect on the rest of your family what you do for God reflects on you reflects on your family and it reflects on your church now you can tell a church that has a pastor that preaches the book because they dress, they look like they're going to church. <laughs> you, hey, some of these preachers ain't going to like that, but it's the truth. And if they don't like it, they don't have to like it. They're going to have to give account to God for their actions. I have to give account to God for mine. Right. But I believe that we ought to just tell it just like it is. Amen. And let it fall where it will. And I believe that I'll give an account to God one day, and if I hadn't told you like it is, then I'm in trouble. Right. <coughs> All right. Then he said, you're to be teachers. The older women teach the young women. What are they supposed to teach them? To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home obedient to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. That's pretty stout right there. You mean if I'm not obedient to God, I'm a blasphemer? Absolutely right. You have changed the truth of God's word. And that's what blasphemy is. Is when you interject something else for the truth of God's word. Amen. That's right. I told y'all I studied this. Come on. I don't believe there's a woman in this house that wants to be classified by God as a blasphemer. But it's up to you to make the changes in your lifestyle that's necessary to meet God's holy specifications. All right. He said, your job is to teach the young women. He said, I suffer not the woman to usurp, to teach or usurp or have authority over a man. But you are teachers. It's the women's job in this church to teach the older women should be teaching the younger women. And teaching them about God. About a godly life. What is a godly life? So that they might teach their daughters. See, this is a thing. Uh, that is the gospel. The gospel should be spread from one to another. And if we're not spreading that gospel inside our homes, 
down from generation to generation to generation that we're not doing what God has called us to do. Amen. So ladies, it's your job to teach them, one by example and the other by the Word of God, what they should be. How they should treat their husbands, how they should treat their children, and more importantly, how they should treat their God. Alright. He said, learn in subjection. I think I've probably been on that enough that that order done sunk in by now. <laughs> then he said, don't be false accusers. Let me go a little farther because he said, he, he, he really said this too, not busybodies or gossipers. Some of y'all don't know why I don't like Facebook. I don't like the gossip of Facebook. I don't like the digging into other people's lives and trying to tear up other people's lives and making uh, accusations about people uh, 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 in a, a, a media that, listen, we ain't, what Jesus tell the woman taking an adultery? Let him that's among you without sin cast the first stone. Yes, right. Who are we to accuse anybody? Who are we to down anybody? And we certainly shouldn't be running around, hey, have you heard the latest gossip? He said, don't be that. Don't be a busybody. Don't be running around spreading gossip and uh, malicious lies and slanders. That's pretty uh, test, isn't it? Pretty straight. Oh. I'm gonna have to. Then he said you need to be temperate or self-control. <clears throat> you need to practice self-control. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Every one of us ought to be in the altar right now in that yeah, one right statement. Right there, yeah to practice self-control. How many of us really do that all the time? Our tempers flare. We say things that we don't mean. But once it's said, it's said and you can't take it back. We hurt people that we don't really want to hurt. And it's all because we don't practice self-control. I'm going to have to finish this tonight. I'm going to stop right there. Now, I'm going to tell you something, ladies. We I'm fixing to give an altar call. And I'm going to ask you ladies and you men. Y'all heard the message last Sunday. Y'all know what y'all's job is. <laughs> ladies, you heard about half of the message today. And you hear the other half is half of that. The other half is better. This is the good part. The good stuff, the stuff you'll like. <clears throat> but you can't really enjoy the good part until you get the other part straightened out. So I'm going to ask you, Ken, I want you just to flip on some. And I'm going to ask you if you'll join me in this altar today. I'm your pastor, and I'm going to get right here in this altar. I can't kneel, but I'm going to sit down right here in this altar. And I'm going to ask God to help me in some areas that I know I need help in. As far as being the husband that 
loves his wife like Christ loved the church and is willing to give when necessary. To be a husband that God would be pleased with. To be a father that God would be pleased with. To be a grandfather that God would be pleased with. To mind God. To let His will be supreme in my life. To help me to forget about what my will is and think about what His will is. Will you join me today? <laughs> Heavenly Father, as I come to you today, I come, Lord, as the pastor of this church, as a husband, and as a father, not even as a grandfather. Father, I know what my place is. I've studied this word for 45 years. I've tried my best to preach it. 